Today we are going to take a look in the scriptures at two different places. If you have a Bible, you might want to open to Ephesians chapter 3 and Acts chapter 2. We're going to spend some time in both of those areas. But before we do, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege of being a part of the body of Christ. Lord, we just ask today that you speak to us, that you open our hearts, that, Lord, you continue all that you've begun in each of us. Lord, help us to, to respond to you daily, to follow you, to seek after you, to knock and ask and receive all that you have for us. So, Lord, bless this time in your word. We ask it, we pray it together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Grab a seat if you would. In the book of Ephesians, you have your place there, chapter 3. Let's start with verse 8. The Apostle Paul to me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. The, the topic, if you will, of the message would be why the church? The church, perhaps you've heard this statement, I love Jesus, but I'm not too sure about those church people. Or the church, it's, it's compromised, it's, it's, it's entertainment. Anybody can start one. It's more about personality pastors and not Jesus. Or I was hurt by the church, I was offended by the church, I was bored by the church. So who needs the church? The thief on the cross didn't need it, and he went to heaven. And, and why so many different groups and denominations? And, and so the question, the, the topic is, why the church? And I want you to tune in. I, I, I'm going to need you to kind of pay attention and listen today. I, I know that's not your normal thing to do in church. <laughs> But today, give it a shot. In the book of Ephesians, Paul says there in chapter 3, in verse 10, that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus Christ. Our Lord. The, the first point in the message is the church has an eternal purpose. It was always in God's heart. It's not an afterthought that God said, oh, I think I'll create the church now. It's central, I believe, in God's eternal purpose. And, and I want you to listen because we, we need to go all the way back, all the way back to the story of creation. Man's in the garden. You know this story. And God has created everything. And God looks at it. He says, it's good, it's good, it's, it's very good. And then he says, but there's one thing that's not good, that man should be alone. So God creates Eve. And so you have the beginning of the institution of marriage. You also have the beginning of the institution of community and culture and family, relationships between others now begins. 
And then came the day when Adam and Eve chose to disobey. And they ate that forbidden fruit, and it brought this deadly consequence, if you will, to our planet, to our world, to our lives. And the result of man's disobedience, I, I would say, is, is, is twofold. And, and, and pay attention, listen, the first thing that happened was a separation between man and God. They're cast out of the garden. They're no longer in the same relationship with God they once were. They're hiding themselves. They're, they're, there's a brokenness, if you will, between the relationship, and sin has entered into the equation. Now, it also brought about a relationship change between man and woman, between one another, between Adam and Eve. Now there's blame. Adam is blaming his wife. They suddenly realize that they're not clothed. There's a, there's a, there's a shame involved. They, 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 they clothe themselves. There's a tension. There, there's, for the first time, obviously, a, a rift, a tension, a problem between the only couple on the face of the earth. And as you follow the story, they have children. The first two children to ever be born, two brothers, and there becomes tension and resentment between them. You've got anger, you've got jealousy between Cain and Abel, and it leads to the world's first murder or homicide. Cain is separated from the family. He leaves, and he goes off to establish a separate community. He builds his own city. And now you have the alienation of cultures as the world begins to populate. And, and by chapter 6, just six very brief chapters, the world is filled with violence and so much brokenness and evil that by the time you go from the garden where everything's good to Genesis chapter 6, God says he has to deal with the world, he has to judge it. You know the story, he sends a flood. He judges the whole human race, and he begins again with one family, the family of Noah. Now, are you still with me? From Noah, communities begin and begin to spread out. There's new issues, new difficulties, new relationship, and there came a time when certain ones said, you know, what we need is a, a mutual gathering, we need a collective security, and they began to migrate eastward to a place called Babel. You know the story. They build this huge city, this giant tower to establish their own culture and really their own independence from God. They were going to build a city based on their own ingenuity, based on their own pride, based on themselves without God. So God intervenes, and he brings a confusion of languages. People find themselves unable to communicate, and so the, 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 the different language groups begin to, to divide and spread out east and west, north and south. And now there's even greater separation and greater establishment, if you will, of cultures and communities across the world. And here's the pattern. Listen, there's disobedience in the garden. Sin enters the world, and it creates two powerful things in the life of mankind. One, separation from God. And two, separation from each other. There's division, there's tension, there's, there, there's separation from the very first family to judgment, to confusion of languages, to establishment of diverse cultures. So mankind is now separated from God. He's separated from each other. And there's this need for restoration to God and to one another. Now, God has always had in his heart, as we see in Ephesians chapter 3, an eternal purpose in mind for the church. So God speaks to Abraham. You say, John, are you going to do the whole Old Testament? No, just stay with me. He speaks to Abraham. 
And he says, I, I will bless you and I'll bless all the nations through you, not just the Jews, not just those who come from you, Abraham. Look up into the sky and look at the stars. I'll bless all. You have this many descendants. And you can follow the story of Israel through the Old Testament, his covenant with Abraham, how God would bless him and all the nations of the earth through him. It's kind of foggy as you as you read it, like, how is he going to do this, and how's it going to happen? Even Abraham was mystified by it. In fact, there, and go back with me to Ephesians chapter 3, it says, for this reason, Paul says, I was given this dispensation by the revelation, and he begins to talk about in other ages, verse 5, it was not made known to the sons of men as he has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, partakers of his promise in, the, in Christ through the gospel, which I'm a minister of. And then he begins to go on and talk about the mystery of the ages, the church. And so what Paul is saying is it's now, which was a mystery in ages past, because the Jews kind of... Uh, got insulated and didn't realize they were to be a light to the nations. And now through Jesus Christ, who was born of the seed of Abraham, God is going to do something different. He's going to include all races, all nations, all cultures. And after Jesus is crucified, raised from the dead, he, he ascends into heaven, a Holy Spirit is poured out, and we pick up the story in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, listen to what it says, verse 5, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem, Acts 2, verse 5, Jews, devout men, and it says, from every nation under heaven, every nation. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? Every nation under heaven, it says. All represented these different languages from, from all over the world and backgrounds. In fact, if you look at verse 10, it says there are people there from Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt. They're, the Africans are there. It, it goes on as you, as you read through this passage. It talks about people from Libya. It talks about Asians there. It talks about Arabs being there. It talks about Europeans being there, people from India and China. Uh, at the day of Pentecost, God brings all nations and cultures together. And instead of confusing the languages this time, God speaks to them in their own language as the Holy Spirit is poured out. And God is birthing on that day a whole new creation, 3,000 people are brought into the kingdom, born again, and on that very first day of Pentecost, the church is born, and all these barriers are crossed, and all races and languages and cultures are represented, and God brings them not only into a relationship with himself, but now he brings them into a relationship with one another. It's kind of like the Tower of Babel backwards, where God steps in and it brings them together and draws them together despite their languages, despite their cultures, despite their background, to respond to the message of Peter as he tells them that Jesus has come, he has been born, he was crucified, he rose from the dead, he 
ascended to heaven. And Peter goes on to say, and whoever calls in verse 21 of Acts chapter 2 on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's why you hear in the New Testament, it says, now there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor freeman nor barbarian nor Scythian nor male nor, nor female. All are one in Jesus Christ. And this has been God's purpose his desire for mankind from the beginning. And so God begins to do something amazing here in Acts chapter 2. Paul talks about it in Ephesians chapter 3 and in Ephesians chapter 5. He talks about the fact that God is now not only reconciling men to himself through Jesus Christ, but he's also reconciling men to one another. That's what the church is. See, they're all side issues. These, these things we have differences over socially and economically and culturally and racially. I mean, we all, however, come to the foot of the cross and we're all equal there. Doesn't matter your race, your language. At the cross, we can be forgiven. This is what Peter is preaching about. And we can be brought back into relationship with God. But we also discover that we're brought into a family where we together can be brothers and sisters in Christ. See, I'm from Northwest Florida. I grew up here, the South. I grew up as a surfer. I, 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 when I began to travel outside of my area, uh, I'll never forget my first time to San Diego. A guy said, is it guff breeze or gulf breeze? So I think I left the L out. Yeah, I'm from Guff Breeze. I mean, that's my background. But I have more in common with someone from Minnesota who's an ice fisherman who knows Jesus than someone born in my own hometown who does not know Jesus. Because that's the family I'm a part of. And it crosses all these barriers. I'm sure you've experienced it if you've traveled at all. You meet other Christians, and suddenly you say, gosh, I feel like I've known this person forever. Because you've got the same father. You've got the same salvation, the same spirit that dwells within you. So you can have a master's degree here today or a Ph.D., and you have more in common with an illiterate who never finished grade school than someone with the exact same degree you have and background of study who doesn't know the Lord. Same with music and tattoos, people who are rich or poor. All the external differences, listen, money, language, education, hobbies, race, Culture will one day completely disappear because our true identity and salvation in Christ will last through all eternity. These other things will not. In fact, if you, if you listen to this passage of Scripture, I'll just read it to you. This is, this is a, a little slice of what it's like in heaven. After these things, I heard a loud voice and a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia. Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the harlot who corrupted the earth and her fornication, and he has avenged her. Again, they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who sat on the throne, saying, Amen. Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne. Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thunders saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Multitudes and multitudes from every race and tribe and tongue, which began on that day of Pentecost, where God began to say, Okay, it's not only time to reestablish relationship with myself through the blood of Jesus Christ, but to break all down all these barriers of race and culture and language that 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 all the angels in heaven are blown away by this. Like, how in the world 
God reconciles men and women to himself from every nation, every culture, tribe, and tongue, and to each other into what he calls the body of Christ, the church. And I will submit to you that this is a powerful thing that only God can do. Only God can do it. That's his purpose for the church, for you and I. See, government can't do it. Government can't bring us back together. The United Nations can't do it. The World Health Organization can't do it. Mandates won't do it. Stimulus checks, that's not going to do it. It'll never be accomplished. The diversity in which we are one is an expression of the awesome wisdom and the glory of God. You know what Jesus said? He said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you can't get along at all with each other. <laughs> no. What did he say? That you, that you love one another. And we love one another because we've been loved by him in such a way, and we recognize that we're a part of a family together. It doesn't matter your skin color. doesn't matter your educational background. doesn't matter your income. It doesn't matter if you're fit and swarthy like me or disabled. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're tall, short, young, old, a hipster, or a nerd, married, single, Jew or Gentile. We're all made a part of the same body, the church. And I would submit to you, you can't find this anywhere else in the world, but except through Jesus Christ. Why the church? Because it's an eternal, Holy Spirit-empowered expression of God connecting us to himself and also miraculously connecting us to each other. And that's why we need the church. Our unity is not in our race. Our unity is not in our culture, our music, our birthplace. Our unity is in Jesus Christ and him alone. We, we need a bigger amen than that. Amen? Amen? <laughs> All right. And many church growth movements, and I, I went to seminary, I went to Bible college, and I get all this stuff online about church growth movements, and, and, you, and you hear, you know, churches saying things like, well, we're going after this slice, the young professionals, or we're going about the, you know, the, the young marrieds, or, or we're after this certain zip code, or some narrow slice of the cultural pie. And I, and I understand that every church, every church has its own personality, its own culture, so to speak, its own style, but that represents our limitations, not our success. It really does. The beauty of the church is what makes us one, and that is Jesus Christ, regardless of age or race. And, and I would encourage you, do not give up on the church. Oh, it's, it's not perfect. Listen to what Paul says there in Ephesians chapter 3 as he's, as he's encouraging them in the church. He says in verse 13, Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations. Don't, don't give up on the church or what God is doing just because I'm going through difficult times, he says. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's praying, from the whole family in heaven and earth his name, that he grant you according to his riches of his glory to be strengthened in might through his spirit, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length, the depth, the height, the width, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of of him. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Number one, the church matters because it's central to God's purpose to help reconcile people to him and to be reconciled to one another. And if you look right over to chapter 5 of Ephesians, it also says, and I'll just read one verse. 
speaking of the church, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, that he might present her, speaking to the church, to himself, a glorious church, no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. The second point of the message is not only that the church is part of God's eternal purpose, but the church has an amazing future. One day, God's going to present the church without spot or wrinkle. You know, as I've gotten older, I've noticed I've got these spots that started occurring on my body. And I started going to a dermatologist. I never went to a dermatologist before, but my wife says, you need to go to the dermatologist. So I go. And, and I have these these spots, they're called mature spots. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But it says here, he's going to present the church without spot <laughs> and without wrinkles. Come on. In other words, God's going to do an amazing thing. You ever heard this story? There's a story about... Uh, a young girl, and she had two ugly sisters and a stepmom, and they treated her bad. In fact, she always had to clean, and, and she, she sat among the, the cinders of the fire, and they, they named her Cinderella. And one day, a king had a great banquet because he wanted his son to get married to one of the women in his kingdom, and so he invited all the young women to come. You guys heard this story before, right? <laughs> so, so they all come, but, but Cinderella wasn't able to go because she didn't have a nice gown and her sisters didn't want her to go. And so, you know, the, you know the story, the fairy godmother comes and does the wand. And she's got this beautiful gown. She takes a pumpkin and turns it into a carriage. And she takes mice and turns them into horsemen and all this. And She's got these beautiful glass slippers, and she comes into the, the ball that the king has held, the prince sees her, and he just falls in love. Problem is, it only lasts till midnight, and she has to go back to being Cinderella. But she leaves behind, you know the story, the glass slipper, and he tries it on every maid until finally he finds it, it to be her, and he marries her and takes her into his palace into his kingdom and it's, a, it's an amazing kind of picture of the church in some ways that's that's full of spots and and wrinkles and 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 in some places in our culture is being treated very very harshly and and even in our own culture today is beginning to be treated that way and one day the Lord will come back and he'll take us into his palace so to speak and there'll be no spots there'll be no wrinkles and he'll present the church to the Father, there'll be that marriage supper of the Lamb, and there'll be no spot, there'll be no wrinkle, there'll be no aging, there'll be just joy in the Father's house. He's coming. And the church has this amazing future. Not only is it now a central purpose and part of his plan, but it has this amazing destiny, this amazing future. And, and here in chapter 5 of, of Ephesians, it also tells us, and this is my third point, that Jesus loves the church. Verse 25 of Ephesians says, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So I, I want to close with this thought. Don't give up on the church. It, it's what God uses to, to help reconcile people to himself and, and, and especially to one another. When, and we so desperately need one another. And Christ loves the church. So, so I say this as, as kind of an a, a exhortation, warning to all of us. Be careful how you treat his church. Be careful how you speak about it. 
Ask yourself how you are participating in it. He, he loved it so much that he gave himself for it. It's his, it's his eternal purpose for, for mankind. The, the church itself could never exist without Jesus being part of it. I mean, think about it. How do we get along together? It's impossible. The church is his great gift that he gave himself for. So we ask ourselves, how can I love and give myself to his bride? So we pray and we, we live and we become together all that God wants us to be. We don't become apathetic or lazy. God is gathering together through Jesus Christ an amazing, diverse body called the church. Central to his purpose, has an amazing future, loved by him in a powerful way, and calls us out of all different cultures, backgrounds, educational you know, processes, languages, to, to become one together in a way that not only we would help people be restored to him through Jesus Christ, but that people would be able to say, wow, those must be his disciples. Look how they love one another, how they forgive one another, how they, how they grow together in him. And, and today, as part of that process of reminding us, we're, we're going to share communion together because Jesus was reminding us in that last meal with his disciples, that he had given his life for the church, his body, his blood. 